When Jeffrey Hinton began work in the 1970s, people said artificial intelligence was the stuff of science fiction and that he would toil in obscurity. Today, he's revolutionizing how we live. Joining us now to discuss the work and what kept him going, here's Jeffrey Hinton, professor of computer science at the University of Toronto and distinguished researcher at Google. Nice to have you here at TVO. Nice to be here. What got you interested in deep learning to begin with? When I was at high school, I had a friend who was a brilliant mathematician who came into school one day and said, you know, in the brain, memories are distributed all over the brain. And so each memory is in lots of different brain cells. And that was a fascinating idea. And I just kept thinking about how the brain might work from then on. Something about that idea planted a seed in you and you were off to the races. Yeah. How many people were involved in this kind of thing then at that time? Um, quite a few people were interested in it then. Uh, and in the 1980s, neural networks were very big and people used them for things like detecting credit card fraud. Um, but then became the neural net winter. In the 1990s, they hadn't lived up to their promise. And most people stopped working on them. But you didn't stop. You it kept at it. It seemed to me there was no other possibility. The brain has to work somehow. And neural networks are a simplified model of how the brain works. Did people tell you, <clears throat> Jeffrey, you're wasting your time. Think of something else to do. Many times. <clears throat> when I was doing my PhD, my advisor would tell me that every week. <laughs> and what did you say back? I would say, well, give me another six months and I'll prove to you that it works. And every six months I would say that again. <laughs> Who got the last laugh? Um, it's not clear. He <laughs> died before this stuff became successful. <laughs> well, I was going to say, you, I mean, here you are all these, how many yeah. decades later still working on this? So Four decades later. Four decades later. Yeah. And it's a thing now, isn't it? It is, yeah. It is a thing. You, you are obviously, I'm detecting from the accent, not from uh, Hearst, Ontario. You're That's from somewhere right. else. I'm from England. What brought you over here? Um, I went to the States first because I couldn't get a job in England. Um, they cut off most of the funding for AI. And after I'd been in the States a bit, I discovered that to, get, to do AI in the States, you had to take military funding. And I didn't like taking military funding. Hmm. Um, but I had a choice between my graduate students starving or taking money from the military, so I came to Canada. There was an organization in Canada called the Canadian Institute for Advanced Research that gave people a very sweet deal where you could come, you could focus on your research, you could do a bit less teaching than professors normally do, and the combination of not wanting to take military money and liking this deal from CIFAR um, made me come to Canada in 1987. It's still around, of course, CIFAR. It's still around. I, for the last 10 years, I ran a program um, doing deep learning. And that was actually very influential in getting these neural nets going again. Hmm. I think Fraser Muster started that many a uh, couple of decades ago. He did, Maybe yes. even further. Yes, yeah. more, more than that. Yeah, the late great. Okay, an article in Wired Magazine said you went from the lunatic fringe to the lunatic core. What did they mean by that? So the idea that um, neural networks will learn everything, that you won't have to program stuff in except for the learning algorithm, um, but all the content they'll learn was regarded as completely crazy by most people in AI. It's still regarded as crazy by many people, but it's now being accepted because it works. So it's sort of mainstream crazy. It's mainstream crazy now. Gotcha. Now, you've got this title. You are a um, distinguished researcher at Google. What does that mean? I don't know. Um, <laughs> I just get on with my research. <laughs> but you're doing something for Google, presumably. Yes, I work for Google. Are you on the payroll there? I'm on the payroll. OK. Um, and. I think my main role is to talk to other people doing research there and try and inspire them, and also to keep coming up with new ideas. Where do you do that work for Google? I do it partly in Mountain View, California, and partly in the Google Toronto office. So you're bi-coastal, as it were, I'm right bi now. Bi-coastal, yes. Uh, in your view, as a country, if we're going to make it in the future, how important is supporting innovation, the likes of which you're into? So maybe my story is different from most stories. I don't know. So I'm just talking about one particular case. But in my case, it was very important to have money for basic research, money that was directed at innovation, particularly money targeted in particular ways, is much less useful to scientists. It's like Canadian tire money. Canadian tire, a dollar of Canadian tire money is worth a dollar. But you wouldn't give me a dollar for it because you have to spend it at Canadian tire. Hmm. And scientific administrators are always thinking that if they say what the money should be for, they're doing something useful. 
Actually, if they say exactly what the money should be for, they're making the money less valuable. If you've got good scientists, you should give them money to get on and do their basic curiosity-driven research. And NSERC, the main Canadian funding agency, um, really understands that. They have a discovery program that's one of the best in the world in terms of giving people money for basic research and being perfectly happy if they then don't do what they said they would do, but do something more interesting because something turns up. The difficulty with that, of course, is that politicians are responsible to electorates who say, oh, you want $100 million for science? Okay, show me what I'm getting at the end of the day for it. Hard okay. to do, right? Well, the curiosity-driven research funded by NSERC and CIFAR um, has produced this new industry, this deep learning industry, that people are putting billions of dollars into. Google's putting about a billion dollars into it. Toyota just announced they're going to put a billion dollars into it. Hmm. Um, Facebook is putting a large fraction of a billion dollars into it. In fact, a graduate student of mine who finished a few years ago just got given a billion dollars to start a research institute in San Francisco. Um, so that came out of the basic curiosity-driven research. That didn't come out of money targeted to specific applications. Elon Musk into that too, I guess, isn't he? Elon Musk was the guy behind this um, new research institute that's going to do open AI. And that's where the research director is, Ilya Sutskova, who was a student of mine. So a student of yours, wow. So we need to just chill. We need to give you scientists the money and let you do your thing. Well, there's a historical analogy. Mm -hmm. If you look at the whole molecular biology revolution, that came out of basic work on discovering the structure of DNA and things like that. And that wasn't done in order to make better drugs. That was done because these guys really wanted to know how inheritance works. Hmm. And there's a whole bunch of people like me now who really want to know how the brain works. And as we get closer to discovering that, it's going to have huge payoffs for industry. But you need to fund the basic scientists to do the basic research. Fascinating. Jeffrey, it's good of you to join us at TVO tonight. Thanks so much. Thank you. Help TVO create a better world through the power of learning. Visit supporttvo.org and make a tax-deductible donation today.